we decided this week to try something new. Mm-hmm. And improved. <laughs> Which was, you're so excited, Vinny. I have... You know where this is going. I do, and I'm going to ignore you. Well, I'm, I'm in denial. We decided... Hi, everybody. Craig's having me on Periscope. I'm in a good mood. How you doing, man? Oh, we decided this week that instead of watching the regular Raw, because I already recap it on Monday, uh-huh. and it's redundant uh-huh. to do this two nights in a row... Yeah. That instead we would do Retro Tuesdays. That's right. This is a great idea. It's a theme. We would have Retro Raw and Retro Nitro on the same night. Thursday we would have Network Night, which would mean we would watch NXT mm-hmm. and, and whatever other else. Other network stuff. Sure. Dinner for three. Uh, I just Very popular, randomly, that Dinner for three. I randomly tur- tuned on the ne- turned on the network today, and the what, the live stream was showing the... Uh, Rivalries episode of Matt Hardy versus Edge. The 10 minutes I watched were great. Yeah. We can watch that sometime. And then Sunday would be whatever day, Ring of Honor, New Japan. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was a pretty good idea. It is a great idea. Well, unfortunately, we have listeners. And every single one of these listeners personally contacted you? Well, not every one of them. No. But. Eight. But. It has been an overwhelmingly negative response, Vinny. They haven't even given it a chance. Well, that's the thing. We're going to try this today. That's right. We're going to try this today. And next week. And we will see... In the week after. ...what the response is. If it's a failure, Vinny, somebody on the board pointed out that we've tried this twice now. <laughs> and twice it has failed. I don't recall this. I don't know why everybody likes it. Actually, I do. I'll say this. They hate me. Well, that's part of it. When I announced this... I was immediately bombarded with people who just said, your idea sucks. So I immediately said, listen, if you would like to explain why you think this idea sucks, beyond you don't like change, I will be willing to listen to why we should do Raw two nights in a row. And yes, Vinny, there were a lot of people that just want to hear you rant about Raw. Yeah, they, they, they like my mental instability, yes. the emotional carnage it wrecks on my soul, the damage it's doing to my spirit and heart. It is cathartic to them. Yeah, for them. Yes. <laughs> it many people for me. Many people brought this up. And they also said, Vinny, which you're not going to care about, but this is a positive. I'll hear. A lot of people said, you know what? There's a million podcasts. And there's a million raw reviews. Mm-hmm. And the raw review on the Brian this, and Vinny show is the, positive? is the best one. I see. They said they enjoy it more than the re- the recap that we do on Observer Radio. They enjoy it more than any other raw recap on the internet. Mm. So if it turns out that that is the majority opinion, we'll go back to reviewing raw here on this show. Does it have to be on Tuesdays? Yes. No. Are you going to do it on Thursday? Actually, yes. Well, then Craig won't be involved. So? What does Craig care about? Craig, Craig is here for the company. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that. But You know what? That's a good point. It's irrelevant because my goal over the next 60 plus minutes is to entertain you, the listener, so greatly that you will demand. But the problem, Vinny, is... That we do Retro Raw and Nitro every week. Many people mentioned that they don't enjoy it when you love the show. Yeah, I know. They hate me. No. They enjoy you eviscerating a show. But I'm eviscerating it because I'm angry and upset. Therefore, they want me to be angry and upset. I'm just telling you what people say, Vinny. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing the obvious conclusions to what they say. Well, I'm sure that's part of it. Yeah. And I don't... Listen, I'm not, I'm not mad at them. I get that. I get that. But it makes my life worse. Hey, Raw makes everybody's life it worse. It does. Raw is a terrible thing. This is thing. not just your problem here. Raw is up there with herpes as far as making life's worse. <laughs> But there's a cure. We can stop watching. <laughs> yeah. There's no, there's no, you can't turn Let's the channel on the herp. see how it goes. You know what? The other thing that confused me was people said, oh, man, you can't get rid of the raw recap because I need to hear Vinny ranting about something. And all I thought was, that's the only thing Vinny's going to rant about? He's not going to rant about raw from 1996, which is a much worse show because than 2015 by raw. By and large, as far as that's the quality, Not this yes. week. This week was actually a pretty good show. But in general, the Raw from 1996 is so much worse than 2015 Raw. You want to hear Vinny complain? That's the show you should be listening to. We did not review it, but because you were in California. 
But I did watch the uh, Raw from the week before this, the one of the main event of Shawn Michaels versus Steve Austin, which I realize sounds great. That show was useless. It was a terrible show. That was a god awful I did wrestling show. It. Yeah, it was very very bad. It was so bad. All right, well, we'll see what happens. What's going to happen, Brian, is I'm going to rock the world. <laughs> Vinny, you may not want to. I am. That's the opposite of what you want to do. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Think about that. Now I'm confused. My tiny brain is not working. All right. Well, listen, we're going to start with Raw tonight, and then we'll go to Nitro, and we'll see how it goes. Which is also a good show. Yeah. So, yes, Raw number 180. October 21st, 1996, the first show after the Buried Alive pay-per-view. Opened with Psycho Sid versus Owen Hart. As threatened, Vince McMahon, Vince McMahon was back on commentary. He announced that Sid had uh, defeated Vader at the pay-per-view, and now he would face Shawn Michaels for the title at Survivor Series. So they had a match here, Owen Hart and Sid did, but that's not important. The most important thing were the two most disturbing signs I've ever seen on a wrestling show. And think of the ground that covers. This is 96, by the way. No one had ever mentioned the word attitude before. At least not as far as an attitude era. But some fan took it upon himself. And uh, I noticed this on Raw and Nitro. I don't know if this is when they started putting the big screens in the arena. But the fans knew when they were on camera and they were trying to get on TV. So this fan knew he was on camera. And he held up a sign that read, and I quote, Hump his face, gold dust. <laughs> I know some of you are thinking I'm making, I'm making a mistake here. That perhaps the sign was in low resolution or in a tiny corner of the screen. No, I went back to check because I at first thought it said hump my face, which would be even more disturbing. But no, somebody held up a sign, hump his face, gold dust. And then later I saw, and I believe it was the same person because it was in the same spot of the arena, slip it to him, gold dust. Yeah. What show did this person think they were going to? Raw. I guess. Have you been watching Goldust lately? Have we talked about Goldust's outfit? Yes. We have. There he was never a, slipped it to anyone. There was a sign very... That I saw. F- very similar to that on... I don't know if it was an NXT show. It may have been one of the takeovers. Some girl wanted Finn to hump her face. Yeah, that was on the internet. It was on the internet? It was on uh, yeah. Twitter. Well, I mean, it must have been it was at a, a show. It, it was in the building. Yeah. It occurred at a show. I think it was Mankind's first book when he wrote, uh, he was very disturbed when he looked down from his hotel room. There were adoring fans on the sidewalk. And one of the young ladies says, I want more than Mankind's sock in my mouth. <laughs> wow. Did you guys watch the Stone Cold podcast? I, no, but it led to the best thread in board history. And I, board, B-O-R-E-D, board. At one point... They're talking about rats. Oh, really? But not in those words. Mm -hmm. They're being very, very careful to use (laughs) words like stimulation. And they are howling. This is better than rats? It was way better. It was way better because they were both trying so hard not to talk about what they both knew the other was talking about. Mm -hmm. As did I and maybe others. It was unbelievable. That's tremendous. Let's talk about how bad Sid was. Sid sucked. Sid was so bad during this match. We have compared Sid to Frankenstein. Mm. Yes. Frankenstein's monster for you geeks out there. Frankenstein's monster would have been a way better wrestler than Sid. Frankenstein's monster was dead. He had giant shoes, which would have made it very difficult to work. Mismatched body parts. Mismatched body (laughs) parts. Everything not fitting together. That's kind of like Sid. It actually is. But yeah, he was so bad. There was a spot where Owen... The dropkick? He did something off the top, and Sid just yes, sat it, down. It was a drizzle drop, drop kick. kick. Sid that was his bump. By dropping to his ass and rolling to his back. And they rewarded this man with a main event a few weeks later. You know what was amazing about it was, the best part of this match was when he was selling. And keep in mind, Sid can't sell. No. no. But because all he had to do was lay on the mat and grunt, yeah. it was the best part of the match. Sid's selling is much better than his striking. I won't say better than his offense because he has some cool power moves, but his punches, he does. his choke slam is cool. <laughs> so he's got one move. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is the first time I've actually watched a retro Raw on the network. It's been a long, long time since I've watched a Raw oh, from man. back in the day. 
Well, don't get your hopes up. <laughs> because this was the best one we've watched in two months. Really? Oh, oh yeah. God, clearly. Oh, yeah. I by, a by a wide, wide margin. That's, uh, that's This show is terrible. That's saddening to me. I, I, I didn't realize how cartoony it was in 96. Even Vince McMahon on the mic Dude. sounds like a morning radio DJ. Yeah. You don't even know, buddy. You don't even know. Go back just for fun and watch last week's show. Yeah, I'm not doing that. That is an example of Raw in 1996. The mystery is not how Nitro won 80-some weeks or whatever it was. The mystery is how this company survived. Yeah. Their show in 96 was, it was shorter. And they were doing it was, terribly in 1996, yeah. business-wise. Yes. And this was their response. Maybe if we have more men coming out with hogs. Yeah. That will turn the show around. So Owen and Goldust are doing this match, and Davey Boy came out at one point. Sid. What did I say? Goldust. Goldust. I'm sorry. I, was... I know you have Goldust on your mind a and, lot, Vinny. And, and face humping. So Owen and Sid are doing a match, and uh, Davey Boy comes out to uh, distract Sid and then just blatantly interfere right in front of the ref, and he didn't care. And they worked over Sid's leg for a while. and There was an amazing spot where Owen goes for a high cross after Sid's been selling for a long time, and the entire spot is... Sid catches him on the high cross and then drops him. Yeah. Doesn't slam him. No. Doesn't lift him up and thrust him into the mat. He just grabs him and drops him, and the place goes <laughs> crazy. He just let go and let gravity take care of whatever happened next. Yeah, and, and that's the other thick key. Audiences have changed, because when Sid made his comeback, and as we've noted, Sid had the worst punches in wrestling history. But this place loved Sid. He's wailing on Owen with these terrible strikes, and they're all jumping to their feet and pumping their fists. And Owen, by the way, part of him, I guess, just wanted to get the best possible match out of Sid. So I think he went up to Sid and said, Sid, your punches suck. So when you're making your comeback, swing your arm like you normally do, but just keep an open hand or slap me in the face. <laughs> because Sid was slapping him in the face over and over again. And as slaps, on a scale of 1 to 10, they were a 3. As punches, they would have been a zero. So Sid uh, makes his comeback. He hits a choke slam, and the place goes bonkers. They're so excited for Sid. And he sets him up for the power bomb, and Davy Boy interferes with the DQ. The two heels are working him over when Shawn Michaels runs out to make the save. Shawn Michaels, after watching Sid, should have been an Olympian. <laughs> Shawn Michaels ran so fast to the ring. That when he slid inside, he could not control his own body. No. He's slipping all over the place. He's wearing s street shoes. Trying desperately to get to his feet. Yeah. And he helps clear the ring. One other thing about Owen. Owen was a ribber. Yes. I don't know if he was ribbing during this match. But after a while, he just started throwing the worst punches and kicks of all time. <laughs> like, I don't know if he just decided, this match is, I've tried, and it's failing. Yes. So now, let's just have a bad match. And he started throwing these punches and kicks that were hideous. And Owen Hart was awesome. So this had to have been done on purpose. There's no other explanation. Either that or whatever Sid has is contagious. <laughs> and Owen caught it. Unfortunately, he wrestled most of the roster. Yes. It's a, well, we talked about how terrible the show was. So Shaw makes a save. They clear the ring. Now, I don't know. Was there a... Earlier this year, in 1996, was there a Sean and Sid reconciliation? Because... Well, there was one last week. Remember they, they high-fived and they chest-bumped? I guess so. That's true. All I know is it's that friends again. Sean right. is explaining to Sid. Sid does not understand yeah, so why they, Sean saved him. They, they clear the ring, and they, they shake hands, but Sid's like, I appreciate your help, but I don't need it next time. And Sean is explaining, Frankenstein, there's two of them... And one of you. Yeah. And Sid goes, ugh, ugh. That's his response. <laughs> You're not wrong. Yeah, somehow, and they didn't have mics, by the way. We couldn't hear anything they said. Through body language alone, we both got the message of what they were trying to convey. So they came to some kind of an agreement. They fist bumped, fist bumped and Sean left. So they're still pals. We had still shots of the buried alive match between man Mankind and Undertaker. Match I don't think I ever saw, and I'm not in a hurry to. So Taker seemed to have the match won. He was about to bury Mankind alive, 
when The Executioner debuted. That would be Terry Gordy under a mask. He broke a shovel over Taker's head. They get Terry Gordy, and he becomes The Executioner. Sure. They have never been shy about reinventing everybody. Can you reinvent someone with a good gimmick? Well. He was the executioner. His gimmick was, he puts you to death. I'm trying to think of anyone who got reinvented with a good gimmick. Does Lex Luger count? Mr. Perfect. All right, there you go. Anyway. So, yes, they put Taker in the grave, and about a half dozen heels came out to help bury him. And then there was some kind of pyro display, and the show ended with Taker's purple glove reaching out from the dirt. Smoking Guns versus the Godwins. This was where Hog and Pig came out with legit bovines. Bovine is a cow, Brian. These were cow. Uh, these were uh, pigs. Povines. I don't know. I'm trying to remember the word for hook Swine. mammal. Swine. Piglets. Dromedaries. Ungulate. That's it. An ungulate. Yep. Yeah. So... A few weeks back, they came out with a goat, and uh, I think I can spoil this. Lance Storm was incensed that the pig farmers would have a goat. They're this, just, they're this is farmers. bad booking. They're farmers. <laughs> they're so, allowed to have a second animal. Don't blame me. So pig and hog come out with their pigs. They have pigs. They put them on the announce desk, and one of them, and I have no reason to doubt this, but one of them apparently peed on Jerry Lawler. Mm-hmm. They were also squealing quite a bit. And eventually they took the pigs backstage. I swear they piped that in. The pig squealing? Yeah. Entirely possible. I'm almost positive. So they're doing this match, and uh, the gimmick was the smoking guns had lost in the pay-per-view. I forget who to. But uh, they're having troubles, because Bart's focused on winning. Billy is focused on porking Sonny. Porking? Porking, yeah. Pig farmers. Yeah. Yeah. So. Vinny's funny sometimes. Once in a while. So they're not getting along. They low bridge Phineas for the heat, but then all their double teams fail, and they bonk into each other, and they're falling down, and Henry gets the hot tag, and we have mentioned this, how uh, how much we did not appreciate Henry Godwin when, this, when we were 20. Henry Godwin was a great, big, thick, scary man who could move. Sure. Maybe it's because they put him in coveralls and made him a pig farmer. It could have been because they hogged farms, or they farmed hogs, or yes, whatever they this, did. This may make it hard to take him, scare, take him seriously. But I'm watching him here today and thinking, Jesus Christ, look at this guy. You know, usually I could see through bad gimmicks. Uh-huh. Could not see through this bad gimmick. This is a very bad gimmick. This one was impossible to see through. Remember when he first showed up and his music was just pigs oinking? Yeah. You know, it's also possible he did follow Sid. <laughs> there is that. <laughs> there is that. So they uh, whipped uh, Bart into the ropes. Bart collided with Billy and knocked him off the apron. And they hit Bart with the slop drop and pinned him. And the smoking guns are having an argument afterwards. And Vince begins to plug the Hall of Fame. And he says, the smoking guns at this rate, neither of them likely to make it to the Hall of Fame. Wow. Burial. Wow. And the funny thing is, I'm, at some point, I'm sure Billy will be. One way or another. Speaking of Billy. Yes. He's put on, what, 70, 80 pounds since 96? They did mention that Ross, his sources told him that the winning team tonight might get a WWE championship match. Might. Sources. Keep in mind, the Smoking Guns lost a tag team championship match the night before. And it's not like they have a huge tag team roster. <laughs> no, this, this roster is wanting. This ain't 1988. So either the Cowboys the pig farmers. or the Pig Farmers are going to be number one contenders. Possible. Or the Englishman and the well, Canadian. I mean, from what we've determined here, will be the Godwins. The pig farmers. I see. I'm trying to think of any other teams that we've watched in the past few uh, weeks. None, none are coming out. None are sticking out to me. Al Snow and Marty Jannetty. The new, new rockers, rockers. New Rockers. I think we did see the... Uh, God, you should have seen Al Snow back then. He's also put on about 70 pounds. That God. too. That's the, But, was, yeah. Uh, we saw the body don- body dons. He had point, no idea what but... he was doing in the ring. Oh yeah, yeah. Like he could do a whole bunch of moves, but he had no idea what he was doing. Very much like us at that exact same time. Well, except his paychecks were a smidge bigger. So they announced Pat Patterson, Jimmy Snuka, and Vince Senior for the Hall of Fame. Yes, in November. <laughs> it's good way, to see that the founder of the WWE made it into their Hall of Fame. It does seem reasonable, doesn't it? 
They showed Mr. Perfect warming up backstage when Hunter Hearst Helmsley rammed a cart into his leg. And Hunter per- put on 80 pounds. At least. Yeah, I, I, I didn't I didn't even notice. I mean, I, I guess thinking about it now, I do with Billy's growth, but we'll talk about Hunter later. But yes, he he's smaller. He looks like his own little brother. Right. He He's the before picture. And there's Charles Atlas. He's, he's the one getting sand kicked in his face on the beach and his yes. girlfriend being stolen. I would say this. His arms were so skinny. Dude. Give it a year mm-hmm. when they do the DX segment backstage with him and China and Sean. Yes, and he's, the and he's got one the there. smallest arms. Yes. Yeah, things change. Sean Michaels. Yeah, <laughs> he was he was significantly larger than Triple H at one point. So uh, here he rams the cart into Perfect's leg, and Perfect goes down. And he grabs his knee. And he just barely gets out of. God damn it! Mm-hmm. Right on camera. And Hunter smiled and he left. He showed Stone Cold Steve Austin yelling at Todd Pettengill and Sonny on Livewire. That sounds like buys. I'd watch that show. Jim Ross called out Bret Hart for a promo. This was the best thing on any of the retro Raws that we've oh, watched yet. Light years. You know what's funny is, I couldn't say it word for word right now, but I knew every single thing that he said in this interview by heart as I watched it. I am pretty sure that I was so blown away by this interview when it first occurred that I rewound the videotape and transcribed it word for word in the newsletter. That's possible. I'll bet you anything, if you went back, you'd find this transcript. That's quite possible. This was the greatest interview. The thing about Brett was he was not the most, well, the most electrifying speaker. He was not like The Rock, obviously. He was not Dusty Rhodes or Hulk Hogan. But when he spoke, there was a gravity... And a believability. Gee, I wonder why. Yeah, mainly because almost everything he said here was, in fact, it was pretty much a fact. But yes, everything about it, everything he said seemed real and important. So, this was his first appearance in a ring on TV since he had lost the title to uh, Shawn Michaels at Mania about six months earlier. Vince is there on commentary saying, we have no idea what he's going to say or do. As if there was ever a possibility... Given he'd already signed, yeah, I'm pretty sure <laughs> exactly. That. Like Vince would have put him in the ring if he didn't know what was going to happen. I will say that when they played his music and he went down to the ring, just his music and him going to the ring made this seem like an important show. That's true. That is true. So Brett acknowledges that in his time away, a rival wrestling organization had made him a great offer. They dealt with him with integrity, in an honorable fashion. He had nothing bad to say about them. And Vince on commentary just goes, I can't believe this is happening. Yeah, I don't like where this is going. And he admits he did not know if he was going to come back to the, or he had not known if he was coming back to the WWF or finding a new adventure somewhere else. You know, some numbskull is going to misinterpret what I'm about to say because it happens on every single show. But I don't care because this is just a fact. This build to Montreal is the greatest angle ever, but it wasn't an angle. Right. It's incredible. This is a full year. year, This is 13 months before Montreal, Mm -hmm. and Brett is doing this promo, and Vince is sitting there, Uh and he's gritting his teeth, and Brett's talking about how he's made this deal to come back, and the competition, and Vince can't believe it's it's just incredible. It's in, when you watch this over the next year, you're going to be astonished at how this all fits together into Montreal, and it's all real. Yeah. And I wonder if Vince was. I wonder. If, I wonder what the point was where Vince went backstage and he went. You know what? This Bret Hart fella is like a real guy doing a real promo that feels completely real. And the fans sure seem to like it more than these damn hog farmers. Why don't we he figured it out? There is a there was a point, and I've heard many, many guys talk about it, including Sean, Hunter, and I think Austin. Where Brett or excuse me, where, where where Vince basically admitted that what they were doing was not working and they're gonna do a more realistic product. And that's when Hunter Hurst Helmsley became Triple H, because Hunter is not actually a snob from Connecticut. And uh DX started around there and that that Things. It took him that long? Yes. Well, he should have figured it out tonight. 
you would think. Let's see. They showed all the heels watching backstage. The key is Steve Austin had been campaigning for a match with Brett for months. So he's back there. Owen's, uh, uh, Owen, Owen might have been back there. Pillman is back there. Um, three or four other guys. And then standing there in the background, barely on camera, Dwayne Johnson. Yeah. The Rock. And I just checked. He didn't even make his debut for another month. And when he did, he was a babyface. What was he doing there? I only needed a body. I guess. You were the sideburns. Come stand here. Because I saw him and I thought, that can't have been The Rock. And I went back and it's The Rock. So, Brett explains that he had not, he had had a difficult decision, but everything he had, everything he had in his life, he owed to his WWF fans and he was not going anywhere. He said, and I quote, I'll be with the WWF forever. <laughs> this angle. <laughs> it's stupid. And it's not. There are times watching this where I'm just cringing, knowing how it all played out. So Vince is relieved and he clapped. All right. <laughs> so Brett says Sean had beaten him fair and square. He made no excuses. He said he considered Sean his opponent, not his enemy. But he admitted there was something about Sean that bugged him. He said Sean might be younger, more popular, maybe even cuter. He was a great wrestler and a great champion. But he knew Sean would never be as tough as Brett or as smart as Brett. And Vince is like, well, I'm not sure that's the case. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah? You think Shawn Michaels may be tougher than Bret Hart? Craig? Brett went on to say, <laughs> Craig is, I'm not going to argue with you. He's biting his tongue right here. Shawn Michaels was super tough. He just posed in Playgirl. It's nothing. Go back and watch Mania. Uh, 14 with Austin. Thank you. They got to fight, buddy. And Brett yeah, beat his ass. Didn't say, but never said. To the toughness and being a good fighter are not the same thing. By the way, the in ability which, to endure. In which Brett ripped Sean's hair out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's tough. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that Sean was just going to do the fisticuffs and Brett grabbed his hair. Yeah. I'm pretty sure if you asked Sean, he would tell you that Brett was way tougher than he was. Probably. Okay. Yeah, but still. And to be honest, he'd probably say Brett was way smarter, too. Brett came up in the dungeon. Sean came up with Jose Lothario doing flips. In Mexico. And I love... Shawn Michaels wasn't in Mexico either. Yeah, I know. Brent went on to say that he doesn't <laughs> dance too well and he doesn't pose for girly books, but he'll be a role model for kids watching at home. Yes, he. Uh... Well, first he first he accepted Austin's challenge. He said, "I am going to accept the challenge of the best wrestler." And he said, "Wrestler in the WWF today." <laughs> well, that was a... okay back then, Vinny. Was it? I had forgotten. <laughs> yes, forgotten when it was banned. Still, though, Shawn Michaels is the champion. Here's Brett calling Steve Austin the best wrestler. He says, I will face Stone Cold Steve Austin at the Survivor Series. And they cut backstage where Brian Pillman begins to mark out. Mm -hmm. He's pumping his fist. He's jumping up and down. He's giggling. And Austin turns around like, calm down, you fool. And it worked. He just gave him a death stare. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? And Pillman calmed down. And then Brett talks about his fans all over the world, how he wants to be the role model, and he tells the true story of his young nephew who mm -hmm. fell ill and... Uh, Flesh-eating disease. Yeah. Yeah, and tragically passed away. And he acknowledged that his story did not have a happy ending, but he said he still wanted to be a role model for children everywhere, and that's when he had his line about not dancing or posing for girly books. <laughs> girly his, books. His, his the, the nephew that passed away, that was Teddy's brother, Matthew right? Annis. I forget, but yes. But, uh, yeah, and he said he was the best there is, was, and never will be, and I'm back. And that was that, and that was great. All-time great promo right there. It really was. All-time great promo. And, yes, this wasn't really a build for Montreal. What was a build for was Mania. It was a build for Survivor Series and their plan for Mania the next year. But yes. regardless, it made you want to see both those matches. Yeah. And it made you want to... It, Gave you a reason to care about this Bret Hart fella and if he won or lost and succeeded or failed. It was awesome. They plugged the Karate Fighters Tournament. If you were not watching in 1996, they didn't actually do a karate tournament. The karate Fighters were these wacky toys where you put them on a little gizmo and spun them around and one of them fell off and that person lost. But they're going over the different characters they had. 
They say there's four different fighters and six sets, six sets of weapons. And Lawler says the possibilities are endless. False. There are 24 possibilities. <laughs> well, you know, that's almost endless. <laughs> this led to Triple H versus Mr. Perfect. So Hunter comes out, and then Perfect comes out limping in his uh, workout jacket. He is accompanied by Mark Marrow, Sable, and Gorilla Monsoon. And Perfect cuts a promo. He says, the whole world saw what you did, Helmsley. You tried to take me out, but I'm going to wrestle. And Gorilla steps in and says, no, no. The doctors have checked you out. You are not cleared to compete. I won't allow it. Hunter starts to mock Perfect, calls him a chicken. A chicken. What are you, a chicken? You have no guts? Perfect says, listen. I'm no chicken. He says, I'm no chicken. So I talked to Mark Marrow. He's a stand-up guy, and he has volunteered to wrestle in my place. Hunter says, no, no, no. I have a contract to wrestle Mr. Perfect. I don't have a contract to wrestle Mark Marrow. I am not going to take any part of this. Unless, unless you put your Intercontinental title on the line. And he makes this challenge, and before Marrow can say anything, Perfect says, of course I'll put his title on the line. And he turns to Marrow and says, what kind of champion are you? So... We'll never know what Mero would have said, but now he had no choice but to accept this challenge and to put his championship on the line. What was amazing about this is, if you've ever watched Gorilla Monsoon do commentary, he's always going to be right. Yes. He's just like Larry. So, they do an angle where Hunter wants to wrestle Mark Mero. Hunter challenges him. He says, I don't have a contract to wrestle Mark Mero, but... I will wrestle Mark Marrow as long as he puts his title on the line. And Mr. Perfect goads Mark Marrow into saying, yes, I will put my title on the line. So Hunter has accepted the match under his terms. Marrow has accepted the match under his terms. Both men have accepted the match, and Gorilla Monsoon has jumped in and say, well, hold on a second. I have not sanctioned this match. I will not sanction this match unless... Both men agree to it. Hunter, do you agree to this match? Hunter's like, yeah, the title's on the line. Marrow, do you agree? Yeah. All right, the match is on. Yes. Like, you fucker. <laughs> had to get his screen time in there. You had to get that in there. You, you had to show that you were in charge. And you made this match. You know, I'm actually okay with it because it just it, it 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 did in fact make the whole thing official. It was already official. My point is, all he had to say was, "All right, the match is made." That's true. Instead, he had to. He did make them repeat what they had said. You know what it was? It was the raw report on Tuesday. It was redundant. <laughs> it was and unneeded. <laughs> yes. So we got Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus Mark Merrow. When you think of Mark Marrow, or at least when I think of him, I tend to think of him in the marvelous Mark Marrow phase and the feud with Sable, with Jackie, who was doing the boxer gimmick. And that Mark Marrow, let's be honest, pretty much sucked. This Mark Marrow was an athlete. Before he tore up his knee, this dude could move, and he looked good tonight. This was awesome. He teased a dive. Hunter pulled Sable in front of him. So Sable slapped him, and Marrow lit into him on the floor, and Finally, Hunter took over, and it was a flashback, obviously, to 1996, and uh, if you were not watching Triple H then, it was comedy. I swear to God, half of his offense was just hit him with his knee. <laughs> Put him on the ground, do a knee drop, pull him up, do a knee lift, throw him on the ropes, do a jumping knee. It was comedy. Mero made his comeback. He went up top. Hunter pushed the ref into the ropes, and Mero got crotched. Then Marrow hit a moonsault body press for a near fall. The ref got bumped. And Hunter goes to grab a chair. He gets in the ring with a chair. And Sable stops him from swinging it. And then Pervert shows up and takes it from both of them. And then, of course, in a move that surprised Vince McMahon and perhaps nobody else, he hit Mark Marrow with a chair. And Marrow goes down. Pervert leaves. Sable leaves, screaming, but still leaves. She was amazing. She was trying to get the rest attention she was animated and screaming and jumping up and down and absolutely losing her mind i believed this woman oh yeah absolutely i'll tell you what was great about this how many times have we seen this stupid finish in the last five years 
Many. A million times. Might have saw it on Monday. Or any finish that involves a screw job. You still have to watch the Hulu version, Vinny. That was our At some agreement. point, I agreed to watch the Hulu version. That's right. Now, the reason this was great was because normally the screw job occurs and the man is immediately pinned. Mm-hmm. Not this time. Mr. Perfect hits Mark Merrill. Merrill goes down. The referee is still recovering. Triple H, of course, because it's Triple H, always has to hit his yes. move. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. This is what I noted. He can't just pin a guy. He's got to do his move. Do you remember... About five years ago, Hunter and Orton had a match on pay-per-view. And like a minute in, Orton took a bad bump and broke his collarbone. Yes. And Hunter still had to hit him with a hammer. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Hunter always has to hit his move. So he hits his move. Point of this is, not only does he hit the move, but Mero is down. The ref is down. The ref is slowly getting to his feet. Sable is screaming. She's shrieking. The announcers are freaking out. The announcers are screaming. Hunter very slowly and methodically picks the man up, his dead body, He sets him up for the pedigree. He looks around at the crowd. He very dramatically hits the pedigree. He slowly turns the man over. He finally covers him, and the referee slowly counts the pin. Point of this is, they built up drama. They built up a ton of drama. This 15 seconds felt like five years to all of those Mark Merrow fans. To all the fans that hated Triple H and loved Mark Merrow and Sable... This was so dastardly, and they got so much out of it. As opposed to today, where it's somebody screws somebody, boom, immediately pinned, and it's over. Yeah. There's no drama. You're correct about that. And the other thing that separates this from every screw job now is I understand from the get go why Mero, excuse me, why uh, Perfect and Helmsley have this elaborate plot. Their plan was if we work together, we can screw Mero and gain the Intercontinental Championship. The you'll have a championship. I'll be managing you. will be a great team. Here's our plan. And it went from there. Screw jobs usually these days are because they have nothing else to do. Yes, this was this was set up very, very well. Although it did involve them punching each other in the face, Once, like on last week's Raw. One punch. Yeah. One bump. He's tough. He can take that. You got to... Tougher than Sean. Apparently. <laughs> I wish that was periscoped. Craig rolling his eyes when I said tougher than Sean. Listen, I love Sean and everything. He's Hacksaw Jim Duggan now, Craig. Did you watch Raw? Yeah. He's Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Well, I watched most of it. He's Hacksaw Duggan. Nothing wrong with the guy. You're not he's selling still, me on this Raw, by the he's way. He's still the best of all time. No, it's just funny to watch Sean come out nowadays. He's got his hat. Big he's, old beard. he's got his hat, the eye. He basically <laughs> says, oh! Just the one, though. You know. He's got his jeans tucked into his boots like it's the 80s. He's still the best of all time. But he's turning into Jim Duggan. Anyway, as much as I praise that, as soon as he won the belt, it was to the back, and the show was over. Mm -hmm. No time for it to sink in. That is true. We had to think about it when we watched Nitro. So that was a much better show than any of the retro retro Raws we have watched in the past. So they're about to get good. Yes. You better hope so. Two or three months, whatever it's been since Lucha Underground went off the air. Let's start with the retro Raw. Speaking of retro. So... We'll save Ming and Barbarian for the main event. As I scroll way down to that part. Show opened with clips of Steve Austin taking out Brian Pillman to the Dracula music. I think it was uh, there was a Dracula, Dracula movie that came out. I think it was Coppola made one. But regardless, that's where this music came from. I found that funny. And uh, if you've never seen this angle, it was the first time anyone put his opponent's ankle into a chair and jumped on the chair. And this is where the term Pillmanizing came from. That's right. Opening match... Double J Jesse James versus Sal Sincere. Do you guys realize this show is live? Hmm. <laughs> it's more mind boggling okay. to me. Yes. I heard Vince say that. But that weirdo with the weird gold dust signs was in the exact same spot. You know what? Okay. I think the commentary was live. I think it may have been the commentary, but I know that they also, at this point, were working on a new plan where they were going to have live cut-ins mm. on a tape show. I see. Okay. So that might have been what this was. Point of this is, what was astonishing to me is later in the show, Vince announces next week we're moving an hour early. Mm. So they're moving from nine to eight so that they can go head-to-head with the first hour of Nitro. And in doing so, they're not only, thank God they don't do this nowadays. I guess it doesn't matter with DVRs, but... 
Not only are they going an hour earlier, they're going an hour and three minutes earlier. Yes. Right. Remember when they used to start three minutes before the top of the hour, and what? then they would go three minutes over? How annoying. Oh, infuriating. But the point of this is, you know why they're doing this, right? I forget. You get the rating. Because they're in a war. Yes. <laughs> That's it. That's why they're doing it. So they, they, the Nitro doesn't get a jump on them. I see. So they want to go head up because they're in a war. And they want to start early so they can get the my, jump on Nitro. Yes. My point of all of this is I have a better idea. How about better matches? <laughs> Do make a better TV show? That'll work. Double J versus Sal Sincere. Aldo Montoya versus Crush. Yeah. A Karate Fighters Tournament gimmick. Hey, that was awesome. Billy Gunn versus Freddy Joe Floyd. That wasn't. So instead of thinking, man, maybe these matches suck and no one cares about them, their idea is, let's move an hour earlier. <laughs> For a second match is on earlier. An hour and three minutes earlier, Brian. An hour and three minutes. So the whole point of the Jesse James gimmick was Vince was mad at Jeff Jarrett and wanted to bury him so he made his own real double J. Now, this is a dumb idea for many reasons, not the least of which is, as soon as he comes out, Vince immediately says, there's Double J Jeff Jarrett, mm -hmm. and King has to correct him. They were trying so hard to prove to the world that we have the real Double J. And then they put Think him in a match this, with Sal Sincere. Yeah. Think about that, by the way. As we talk about Nitro, the actual Jeff Jarrett debuted on Nitro. And what did they do with him? He's immediately going to be Ric Flair's replacement yeah. in The Four Horsemen. Yes. So Vince's plan is we'll tell the world who really sang, and then we'll have him wrestle Sal Sincere. In a competitive match? Yes. So they're doing their match. It is a totally fine, acceptable TV match. But the whole point I'm the whole the whole time I'm watching it, I'm like This goes head to head with Nitro. And I watched I had just watched Nitro first. And everyone's gimmick on Nitro at some point boils down to this guy's a badass. Some guys are badass from the Polynesian Islands. Some guys are badasses with a lot of money. Some guys are badasses from Hollywood. Some guys are little small guys, but they're still badasses who beat each other up. But the point is, all of it comes down to they're badasses who want to beat up their opponent. Here I am watching a man pretend to be Italian in pink and another man pretend to be a country singer in teal. Why? Why was I watching this? Because they thought these characters were going to turn the wrestling world around. So I'm watching this blatantly fake show, and uh, Double, J, Double J wins with the greatest move in all of pro wrestling, the pump handle slam. That was your finish. <laughs> that was my finish, yes. What did you call it? I was thinking about it. I don't think you ever had a name for it. <laughs> you didn't even name your own finish. I don't think so. Wow. This looks so re low rent with them referring to Double J, knowing that he's on the other show. This, these are the same people that just a few weeks ago had a fake diesel and a fake razor. Yeah. It, it felt so very TNA. But this is different, Craig. They were trying to pretend that this was the real Double J. Fake Razor and Fake Diesel were clearly knockoffs. But they were trying That's to pretend true. WCW got the fake one this time. We got the real Double J. I see. This guy was the real guy who sang. They actually were trying really hard. They had pictures of him in the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. But again, he's wrestling Sal Sincere. <laughs> That's the end right there. And the, and the whole point is, he can sing. Right. So watch him wrestle. Yeah, who cares? I know. <laughs> it's just so dumb. I will say that With My Baby Tonight was a pretty snappy little tune. It's a good song. It's not as good as Jarrett's music in WCW. No, it's a good song, too. But this one at least has, this one has lyrics. It does have lyrics. And when you watch Jesse James come out, people were singing the song. It's a catchy little tune. So the one guy, maybe in the entire company who realized how dumb stuff like fake Italians versus fake country music singers, or real country music singers was, was a man named Steve Austin. Heard of him. And this show, we've been watching Raw now for, what, two, three months? And Steve Austin has been on it, and he's been a guy. He's been calling out Bret Hart, who clearly was a top guy, but week in and week out, Steve Austin's just a dude. And this was the show where Steve Austin took over. And we all... We all know about the King of the Ring event he won and the Austin 316 promo. And we, when people look back, they tend to point to that night as the But night. that's not it. They, yeah, that was not it. Maybe I'm wrong, but this show... This was it. This was it. Okay, it's not just me. No, this, yeah. was, this was the show where he turned the corner. Steve Austin grabbed the WWF audience, the WCW audience, and people who had never watched wrestling before. And he grabbed all of them and said, 
Come with me. This is going to be awesome. So Doc Hendricks, speaking of fake gimmicks, he's plugging the Survivor Series weekend in the Hall of Fame and all this. And Steve Austin comes in shouting at him, interrupts him, berating him, embarrassing him, emasculating him. Says, now you you go back and do your job when it's time to call me in. You introduce me, goddammit. So Hendricks goes back to running down the card. And then he runs down what's happening on Raw. He says, we have Steve Austin here in studio. And we also have Bret Hart appearing live via satellite from his home in Calgary. And oh, Austin man. flipped out. He's a home in Calgary. You flew me from Texas to the stupid studio in Connecticut. And he gets to stay home in Calgary. What the hell is up with that? He was awesome. And he said, either way, I'm going to whip Brett's ass. And uh, they went to commercial, or they had plugged some other stuff before commercial, and they come back, they say, here's a shot of Bret Hart. And Bret Hart is, in fact, at home in Calgary, sitting in front of his fireplace, playing with his cat. Yeah. Not making that up. <laughs> no. It's <laughs> better later. They cut immediately to Steve Austin as some poor woman is trying to put makeup on, and he sh- 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 chases her away. Get that makeup boy from me. Steve Austin was already great. Crush versus Aldo Montoya. Dear God. It gets better. Let me let me talk about this match. It's Aldo Montoya against Crush. First off, as the match begins, they decide what's important right now is to get Mark Merrow on the telephone. Oh yeah, to talk about how he was screwed out of the Intercontinental title last week. Guy's not even at the show. No, he's on the telephone, and so. He's ranting and raving about how angry he is and how he's going to get his revenge. And Vince hangs up on him more rudely than I've ever hung up on anybody in the history of Observer Life, including Ed. Hangs up with such abruptness that Jerry Lawler, who is a heel, and keep in mind Mark Merrow was a babyface, even Jerry Lawler is offended at Vince McMahon hanging up so rudely on this man. Jim Rawson comes out. And Jim Ross makes one mention of how we're witnessing prelim action. Mm -hmm. Vince is pissed. (laughs) Vince starts launching into this lineup of what we've got coming up on the show tonight. And unfortunately for Vince, what they've got coming up is matches like Billy Gunn versus Freddie Joe Floyd. At least we had Shawn Michaels on the show. But Vince is ranting and he's bringing up everything here. And in the middle of this, Crush wins with a heart punch. Jim Ross says, well, that's a move that would never work on you, Vince. And Vince, totally deadpan, says, what do you mean? (laughs) Not always the brightest bulb in the... This uh... segment (laughs) was horrendous. Not to mention Ross was talking about Aldo Montoya and said, I suppose that jockey strap that's on his face was your idea too, Vince. Oh, yeah. Just blew him off. We're entering the reality era. It, uh, well, there's notes on that. First of all, on the phone call, the one thing you overlooked was the graphic they put in the screen where it was Mark Merrow looking mean and the graphic read, this is a quote, on the phone, wild man. <laughs> so, yeah, they hung up on him. They announced that Farouk had now joined Clarence Mason stable and they would be on live wire, and Jim Ross promised there would be some big changes. I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> that turned a corner as well. So Crush wins, and the gimmick was that he had been in jail. So all the fans had jailbird signs. Conveniently, a dozen fans right by the entrance, we all had jailbird signs. <laughs> Your cats are going to be throwing <laughs> dishes around. My cats just attacked us. Guy like Steve Austin did. I, he did. <laughs> so... Crush grabs a security guy in If you would have been talking about when he threw that guy into the ladder and that sound effect occurred, that would have been perfect That would have been perfect, yeah. Crush starts beating up a security guy, and Vince screams with glee, there's going to be a lawsuit here. I thought, Vince, you're the one getting sued, buddy. <laughs> this happened under your watch. Oh, Vince. That was terrible. That was terrible. They showed Mr. Perfect and Triple H swerving Mark Merrill last week. Then they announced that, as punishment, Gorilla had suspended Perfect from wrestling, so he could only be an announcer. (laughs) Oh, no. No more bumps for you, young man. You're not allowed to go through with a plan you were never intending to go through with. That's right. You're back to your same old job. He should have, his punishment should have been, now you really got to wrestle, dude. Well, instead, he was in the Karate Fighters Tournament. His opponent was Phineas Godwin. 
He outsmarted Phineas. He cheated to win. And after winning... A he... distraction finish in a karate <laughs> fighters tournament yes. in 1996. That'll happen. That'll happen. And after he won, he celebrated by pointing at Phineas and saying, You dumb hillbilly! And I laughed and laughed and laughed. That was a great segment. Speaking of historic moments in Raw uh, history, they plugged Brian Pillman last week appearing live from his home. Next week. Oh, no. <laughs> Steve Austin is going to Brian Pillman's house mm -hmm. and, next week. And th when Austin hearing this said, what the hell? You go to Bret Hart's house. You go to Brian Pillman's house. You don't come to Victoria, Texas. Screw this. I'm going to crash the party. I'm going to Brian, Brian Pillman's house. I'll be there next week. You know, I was watching every single show during this period, and I don't know what happened. Maybe my VCR didn't record or something, but I never saw this show live really? when he went to Brian Pillman's oh, that house. One. Yeah, yeah. There were moments. Oh, I saw this one. Yeah, there were moments uh, of Steve Austin's promo later. I remembered, and there were moments in Roddy Piper's promo on Nitro that I remember almost word for word. So th this was a big night for me, apparently. So as Austin's ranting and raving and threatening to go over to Pillman's house, Vince says, and I quote, what kind of a creep are you? A creep! <laughs> so Austin then reveals, as, as Vince is ranting, and he's saying, you know, Gorilla Monsoon should do something about you. You, you Pillmanized Pillman's leg. You're threatening to go to his house. What is Gorilla going to do? And Steve Austin reveals, everybody knows Gorilla Monsoon is only a puppet. You run this ship, Vince. What are you going to do about it? You know what you're going to do about it? Nothing. Because me and Bret Hart are going to make a ton of money, and you're the promoter. And I'm thinking, clearly Russo's started at this point. Probably, actually. With all yeah. of this reality stuff. And <laughs> Craig is clearly periscoping you as we speak. I'm about to. Vinny looks so uncomfortable. He's shaking his head. Craig's been silent for like 10 minutes. I look over in curiosity. Is Craig still here? And Craig's holding up his phone, pointing at me. So, yeah. Uh, then they went to, the, went to break. Oh, and he added, and he added, I'm very happy to make all this money for this main event with Bret Hart, but I do this fight for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they went to break. When they came back, the idea was they would get Bret's response, but there were convenient technical difficulties that allowed them to stretch this angle over the course of the entire show. But what was funny about it was you, you kind of could sense there were technical difficulties, but what appeared to happen is Steve Austin is on one side of the screen. Bret Hart is on the other side of the screen with all of his kids. They're paying yes. for satellite time. Yes. Bret Hart, who has just returned to the company, is about to speak. Steve Austin is about to speak. And suddenly, they just play Sonny's music and cut away. That happened. <laughs> You're right. It was not quite as rude as when he hung up on Mark <laughs> Merrill, but it was way up there. The, these technical difficulties were happening exactly when they wanted them to. Billy Gunn versus Freddie Joe Floyd, with Sonny on commentary. They did show Billy had turned on Bart on Superstars, leaving him alone to fight the new Rockers by himself. So Billy Gunn, in his singles debut, was beating up Freddie Joe Floyd when Bart came out to confront him. They went face-to-face. -face. The rest pulled Bart away. Freddie made his comeback, and Billy came off with a stun gun and one with a top rope leg drop. Boring. It was very boring. And uh, Sonny had a line where she talked about how Hillary Clinton was her hero and was going to be the next president. In 1996. In 1996. We were stuck. All right, Craig. <laughs> we got this Periscope now. gimmick now. What's that? <laughs> we're good with the Periscope. I've only been filming like two minutes. I know. People are paying for this show. They're not paying me. Well, let's get your thoughts on these matches we've just been talking about here for the listeners on oh, iTunes. Hold on. i got to turn it off. <laughs> we'll wait. <laughs> no hurry. No, um, I was going to say, uh, Freddie Joe Floyd, I would have a match with that guy. Sure. That guy's awesome. He's still working. Yeah. But would you periscope it? I could do both, yes. How's nobody done that yet? Somebody, I'm sure it's going to happen. Somebody put a clip of him somewhere. Of Freddie Joe Floyd? Well, Tracy Smothers. And he, he's still working. And he was doing the gimmick where he was dancing to his ECW music. All I can think was, imagine if I showed this to a non-wrestling fan. Here's a man, probably in his 60s by now. He's wearing a black singlet with a Confederate flag in the front. 
dancing to hip hop music in a wrestling ring. <laughs> yeah. Let's try try to make sense out of all that. Hey, you know what that is? That's something that you should pay money to see. Sure. Oddly enough, you can periscope with Sonny for money. Wow. That's what I've heard. Cool. Well, now you, you, we know we know your next assignment. Hmm. It's it's for work, honey. You have to. <laughs> all right. Uh, bu- bu- bu. We finally got to hear from Brett. I bet you anything, Craig's wife would be cool with that, because of the pain and the torture that would ensue. What? Sunny? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> so, they had the split screen. Bret Hart is on the right side of the screen, looking right into the camera. Steve Austin's on the left-hand side of the screen, and he's looking at a monitor or something, but it looks like he's staring a hole right through Brett. Now, that made it so much more awesome. You know what this was? This was Conor McGregor and Uriah Faber... It Both was facing off via satellite. It really was. Where Brett is playing Uriah Faber, where he's a normal guy trying to cut a normal promo, and Steve Austin is a total gimmick, and he's in total gimmick mode, and Brett can't help but laugh at this clown. Yeah. That's that is happened. exactly what this was. So Brett starts to talk about how he had taken a break for the first time in 12 years to let himself heal up. And he was not trying to avoid Austin. That had nothing to do with it. Austin cuts him off says, you were afraid I was going to kick your ass. And Brett tries to reply, and he says, I was not afraid you were going to kick my... He pauses. He thinks about it. He's very careful. He says, ass. <laughs> Poor Brett. And Austin says, yeah, there you go. Austin was encouraging him. It was awesome. So Vince asks Brett about ring rust. Austin demands Brett answer, and then... Is, Staring and listening at him intently. Every word Brett says is crucial to Steve Austin. They talk about uh, would Brett come back if Austin beat him. And Austin cuts him off. He's ripping on all Brett's catchphrases. He says, I'm the best there is. I'm the best there was. I'm the best there ever will be. He finishes this, and there's like four seconds of dead air. And Austin just screams, say something. It was so great. They were starting to wind things up. Austin was pissed off about being cut off, started bullying production geeks, throwing them in the ladders, tossing monitors around. And the last words Austin said to Brett were, this is Austin's house now. And let me tell you something. Fact. As of this show, this was Steve Austin's house. Everyone else was just holding his spot and getting in his way. This was awesome. This was the best Stone Cold ever. You notice that when they show all of these videos from the Attitude Era, they took a bunch of stuff from this show. They had Austin throwing the dude into the ladder. They had Shawn Michaels coming down to the ring and doing the high five with Jose Lothario. These are things we've seen in a million WWE vignettes. All from this historic show. But I'm not exaggerating. Austin had been a guy, and here he was. By the end of this hour, you were thinking, that's going to be the top guy in the company. That guy has way more potential than Shawn Michaels or Bret Hart or The Undertaker. How ironic. Uh Uh-huh. Well, Vinny, on Thursday, you can compare and contrast Steve Austin on this show with Roman Reigns on Raw. Which was a bigger turning point show this week for a guy? Hmm. All right. I will Roman say the Reigns was set the man high. on Monday. Okay. I can't argue. I haven't seen it. Davey Boy Smith versus Shawn Michaels. Ah, what a match. Throughout this match, they were saying things like, well, the, the security guards have called the cops on Steve Austin. And the cops are on their way, giving all these kind of updates. Owen was on commentary. Notice Sean has stolen his enziguri. So this match, let me tell you something. This match was Shawn Michaels and Davey Boy Smith, and they were going through the motions. But Shawn Michaels and Davey Boy Smith going through the motions puts in the top 10% of matches I've ever seen. They were do- they doing nothing were so awesome. This was every match these two guys had where... At the beginning, Shawn Michaels will do a high spot, grab a hold. A high spot, grab a hold. A high spot, grab a hold. Then Davey will lift him over his head and drop him neck first on something. And then they'll do a high spot, Davey will grab a hold. They'll do a high spot, Davey will grab a hold. Over and over again. And then Shawn will make a big comeback. And unfortunately here, we had a lame DQ. We didn't have a lame DQ for the but second week in a row. Man, what a great... Old school, yeah. Grab a hold match. Absolutely, that's what this was. A grab a hold match. Now, there's a, a textbook grab a hold match. There is a stipulation we need to bring back. 
You can keep your hell in a cell. For, I want to grab a hold match. <laughs> forget a stipulation. How about you teach everyone how to have a grab a hold oh, that's match? That's true. You need a promotion. The Grab a Hold Wrestling Federation. If it ain't broke. Yeah. Um, Owen, Owen was actually out on commentary, and uh, I laughed at him. He says, uh, he wants to know what makes Shawn Michaels so great. And he grabbed his Slammy Award and pushed it towards the camera. He says, he doesn't even have a Slammy Award. I think about six months later, he got one. Might have been. Yeah, but uh, he's, he pointed out he doesn't have a Slammy Award. He's not a tag team champion like I am. Yeah. By the end, I think Owen ended up having the tag champs and two Slammy Awards. and Owen did well. Owen was great. So Sean preps for the super kick. Till he fucked up this match. <laughs> Owen went over and grabbed Sean's really Sean mad feet. about this. Huh. 19 years ago, dude. God damn it. Owen runs over and grabs Sean's feet and Bulldog attacks They didn't Sean even have and... a good finish. No. Their idea was, all right, Sean, you and Bulldog go out there, have a grab a hold match, and then at the end, Owen will grab a hold. Your foot. And that's a DQ. He did, actually. Like, that's it? Yeah. You didn't hit him with a slammy. You didn't. You just grabbed his foot for the DQ. Yes. <laughs> so their double team is Sean, and Sid runs out to make the save. In the melee, Sean bumps into Sid. They have a shoving match. And as they're going face-to-face, Owen cuts a promo, interrupts, and challenges the two of them to a tag team championship match. And Sid and Sean were totally fine with that and suddenly best friends again. You know what's amazing about this? As much as I hated the finish, I'll tell you what was great about it. They're having this brawl. Vince is alerting us that Sid is about to explode. Which, thank God, he didn't. They're angry at each other. They're in each other's face. They're screaming at each other. They're about to break down into fisticuffs. And on the outside, Owen Hart says, If you two numbskulls agree to fight us, we'll put the tag team titles on the line. And instantly, Sean and Sid are best buds. Chums. They stop fighting. Sean and Sid no longer care that one of them elbowed the other, maybe on purpose. They shake hands. What are you looking at? The moon's coming through the clouds. It looks really cool. Distracting me. Sorry. I, was... I thought there was like a spider crawling around in here or something. No, I was looking at the moon. But this wouldn't happen if you had blinds. The blinds are coming, geek, within right. the next two weeks. All right. Point of this is they put away all of their differences because they want to win the tag team titles. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> they won't work with anyone for a chance to win those. Last thing they showed was uh, Steve Austin... Leaving the building, noting the cops won't do anything. Vincent Man won't let anything happen to me. He turns the corner, the cops are waiting for him, and he's just pissed at them. He cuts a promo on them, and the show fades to black. But this show was a turning point. It was a turning point, but the first uh, two-thirds sucked. <laughs> this was every WWF show of the era. This match went uh, just under 12 minutes, and I can honestly say for the first 40 minutes of the show, it was no good. It was every WWF show of the era, a very poor undercard, and a great main event. This is the first time my son has actually sat through a Shawn Michaels match. What? We haven't gone back and watched any old Shawn Michaels, and I was watching it, and he came by and sat on the couch, and the the match got over, and my son looked at me, he goes, Shawn Michaels was really good, Dad. I said, yes, son. It's a wise, yes, he was. It's a wise young man. Very, very disappointing you haven't shown him Shawn Michaels earlier in this. He's nine. I understand that. It's been nine years. What about when Shawn was still wrestling? That wasn't that long ago. Um, Three, four years ago? I don't remember. He hadn't been retired that long. You need to get well, on as that as this is. Anyway. I made Whitney come up here and sit here so my unborn child could watch Shawn Michaels on the screen from inside the womb. I don't know if you're joking or not. <laughs> she was in here, actually. So many horrible jokes running through my head right now. She was in here. I was like, Whitney, now do you understand why Shawn Michaels is the greatest wrestler ever? Look at this man she's having with Davy Boy Smith. And what did she say? She didn't get it. Eh. <laughs> Shocking. 